Thank you, Jennifer. Tim, Marilyn, Carolyn, choir. The choir looked especially good this morning, didn't they? Come on now, church, encourage them. I need to change the oil in my Silverado. And I know I can't do it today. Today's the Lord's Day, so I get a pass today. But it's just been bugging me for the last few days. I need to change the oil in my Silverado. I try to change the oil in all my vehicles every 3,000 miles. I know some people think I'm crazy, but I've done that for years. And I'm a couple hundred miles over on the oil change in my Silverado, but I have found reasons all week long to not do it. Every single day I had what I thought was a valid reason for not changing my oil. It was a busy week for one thing. And in the, in the weather, the weather was just horrible all week. Uh, and those of you that like clouds, I don't understand you. I need the sun. And when it's cold outside, you know, you don't want to get out there because your, your hand is going to slip off that wrench and it's going to hit another part of that motor and it's going to test your Christianity, what comes out of your mouth. <laughs> so that was a pretty good reason not to change my oil. So I've had good reasons all week long to procrastinate changing the oil in my silver oil. Now, I was just wondering, you don't have to raise your hand or anything, but is there anybody out there who's with, anybody out there who procrastinates, do you ever put things off? Amen. It's that Justin is willing, he's brave, because he knows nobody's looking at him. Do we ever put off the things that we know God has called us or asked us to do? Jacob was having a problem with this today. You know, we've been following the life of Jacob in Genesis, and I invite you to join me today in your, your Old Testament, if you get your Bible out, Genesis 35, right at the beginning of that chapter, verse 1. And get your bulletin out while you're at it. We'll take a few notes to kind of crystallize our thoughts as we look at this. God remembers our promises that we make to Him. Genesis 35, verse 1 says this, Then God said to Jacob, Go up to Bethel and settle there and build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. Now Jacob is the grandson of the great man of faith, Abraham. His father is Isaac. And when he was a younger man, he got crossways with his older twin brother Esau and had to leave town. Esau wanted to kill him. This was some 20 years or more before this. And when he left town, on his way out, he stopped at a certain place. He didn't have anything at all. He slept outside, took a rock and made it his pillow. And, and that evening as he was leaving his country on his way to Peyton Aaron, where he would be for some 20 years and not see his family, that evening he had a vision. And in the vision he saw a, a ladder that reached from heaven to the earth. And God was standing at the top of the ladder and there were angels ascending and descending on that ladder. And when he woke up the next morning, he said, how awesome is this place? This is nothing other than uh, the gate of heaven. And he set up a pillar and he poured oil on it and he worshiped there, but he made a vow to God at that point. He made a promise. Here's what he said. He said, if God will be with me and watch over me on this journey that I'm taking and give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I've set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, he said to God, I will give you a tenth. I will give you a tithe. Now, more than 20 years have passed, and God has been faithful with him. It hasn't been easy at all times. But he's back in Canaan. He's come back home. And he made it safely. He has, he has multiplied. He has a family. Uh, and he's wealthy. But when he came back to Canaan, he stopped in Shechem. And he didn't go back to Bethel, where God told him to go. He came almost all the way there. And before taking that last leg of the journey to Bethel, where God told him to go, that place where he had met God 20 plus years before, and he's languishing there in Shechem. Now we saw last week in, in Genesis 34 that Shechem turned out to be a horrible place for him. And some bad things happen. But after 20 years, God finally appears to him here in verse 1 of chapter 35, and he says, you need to finish up. Do what you vowed to me, what you promised to do to me more than 20 years ago. It's time to go up to Bethel. 
it's time to go up to Bethel. Now, here's the first thing I'd like us to write down uh, on our outlines today. We need to know this to understand this story. If you've been reading all the way through the Old Testament and you still have in mind Genesis chapter 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, then you know what's happening here. If you just drop down in the middle of the story, we may not catch everything that's going on. Why did God send Jacob to Bethel? There's a reason for this. And here's the first answer today. Jacob made a promise to God that he was delaying. He was delaying. Jacob made a promise to go back to Bethel to worship him there, to make that the house of God, and to, to give a tithe to God in that place. But he stopped in Shechem. Now look what happens in verse 2. So Jacob said to his household and all who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel, where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. Now, the first thing we notice here is a little bit of surprise is that Jacob and his family have these, um, these foreign gods, these idols. In the ancient Near Eastern world, they would make idols. They could be small. They could be as large as, as a person. Uh, and they would set them up in their houses. They would build temples for them and put them in a variety of places. And they would bow down to them and they would worship them. And in some cases, uh, they did very vile things as part of the worship. And we're surprised here to learn that uh, Jacob, the man of God, has in his household, or at least some of the people in his household, have some of these idols. But if we think back, if we know the story of Jacob, we remember when he escaped from Pagan Aram. Remember he skipped out on his father-in-law Laban because he was afraid of him. And his, his wife Rachel stole Laban's household good, household idols, uh, and hid them away. And it may be that uh, that's the kind of thing that she's still carrying around and some others in the household still have. But Jacob, without being told by God that it's important, he knows intuitively that to go and meet with God means we've got to get rid of the foreign idols. We've got to, we, we can't show up and worship God carrying idols in our hand. And he also knows intuitively that to meet with God is so special that we need to wash up and change our clothes. That may sound strange to some, but uh, as we follow the Bible, when we get to Exodus, when God meets with his people at Sinai after bringing them out of cruel bondage in Egypt, he tells them, I'm going to meet with you, and I want you to get ready, and, and I want you to do several things. I want you to wash up. I want you to change your clothes. I want you to abstain from having sexual relations. I want you to get ready to meet with me. Get ready to meet with me. This is a... This is an important thing, uh, and it's a um, kind of a, I guess, a controversial thing today. People say, well, I, I don't have to dress a certain way to go to church, do I? I mean, God just wants me to, right? Well, notice what, notice what Jacob says here. He says, come, let's go up to Bethel where I'll build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress. And with me wherever I've gone. I got to thinking about that the first time I read it, and I asked myself, what day of distress? Was, was he talking about the day that he had to flee from Esau because Esau wanted to kill him? Was he talking about the day that he ran into Laban and fell in love with Rachel and Laban fooled him into marrying uh, her sister Leah and he had to work an extra seven years to get the woman that he loved? Was he talking about the day of distress when Laban wouldn't let him leave and he ended up working for him another six years and trying to take advantage of him? Was he talking about the day of distress when he... He secretly left and tried to get away from Laban, and Laban caught up with him, and he was afraid that Laban was going to destroy him. Was he talking about the day of distress when uh, he got back home, and he, he sent a word to Esau, and Esau came out with him with 400 men, and he thought for sure that Esau was going to destroy him? Was he talking about the day of distress when the night before he met Esau, a man showed up and wrestled with him until daybreak and touched his hip and left him limping for the rest of his life? Which day of distress is he talking about? The fact is that Jacob has had many days of distress in his life. And it's remarkable that he can say, with all of these days of distress, a list about as long as your arm, that he can also say that God has been with me wherever I have gone. That's really astounding. I bet there's not a person in here this morning that couldn't come up with some kind of a list. If I were to ask you, have you had a day of distress in your life? Oh, a day? A day? Singular? Let me tell you about my days of distress. 
But in the midst of all of that, those days of distress that we have endured so far, and there may be more to come, I don't know. I'm not trying to curse anyone this morning. I hope you're done. But in the midst of all of those days of distress that we've experienced, could we also with Jacob say, nevertheless, wherever I've gone, God has been with me. God has been with me. I've seen him in the day of distress. Now, Jacob is an older man now, and he's, he's maturing spiritually. He's reflecting back on his life, and he's beginning to realize that even in all of these days of distress, God has been with him. And I didn't even mention one of the days of distress. Maybe one of the most intense was in the, the previous chapter. We looked at it last week. Remember, while he's hanging around at Shechem, his children grow up. They're adults. His daughter, Dinah, goes out to see the women of the country, and one of the local leaders, or his son, takes Dinah and rapes her. His dad shows up at the camp and says, my son wants to marry your daughter. Doesn't even bother to mention that she was raped or, or say, well, I'm sorry, my son... Uh, Rachel, your daughter, I, I, I feel so bad about this. What can we do to make this right? No, none of that. We just, my son wants to marry your daughter. Jacob remains silent. It's hard to understand why. And then his sons take over. They go into town, kill the guy who raped their sister, kill his father, kill every man in the town, take all the women slaves and their children, and take all of the plunder that's in the city. And we're thinking, that's a little bit over the top. And we go through chapter 34 and we think there's no heroes in this chapter. It's one of those chapters where God's name is not mentioned at all. That was a day of distress for Jacob too. And we get to the end of that and we're wondering, where was Jacob? Where was Jacob? But then we start chapter 35 and it's like coming out of a desert into a garden. And the change is that he gets a word from God. And suddenly he finds himself again and realizes who he is, his true identity. And he finds, his, he finds his leadership with his family. He says, get rid of the foreign idols. Wash up, change your clothes. We're going to Bethlehem. I'm going to build an altar and we're going to worship God there. The change was God's Word. We need a Word from God. Every one of us, all the time, as much as we can get a thing is that God has given us a Word. It's right there in your lap, I hope. The question is, are we opening it up? Are we listening for God's voice? Verse 4, so they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had, the rings in their ears, and Jacob buried them under the oak of Shechem. The earrings, nobody knows. This is one of those fun things to read about in the commentaries. You think, well, surely there's somebody who's researched this and figured out what, what this, this deal is with these earrings, and you start to read and you realize, no, it hadn't happened. But obviously there was some sort of religious or spiritual significance to these earrings, and so they went with the foreign gods, with the household idols. They're under the tree, they're buried, and they're ready to meet with God. So we're back to getting dressed again. This has been a, an interesting discussion during my life in church. Do we really have to dress up to go to church? Doesn't God just want me to be there? Doesn't He just want me to show up? Are we putting a barrier on God's presence, if we tell people they need to dress a certain way to come to church, this has been the discussion that has gone. And let's face it, we live in a generation that has pushed casual all the way to the limit. We're not just the casual generation, we're the casual, casual generation. We can wear a t-shirt to anything. We can wear shorts anywhere. Flip-flops, it doesn't matter. People wear their pajamas to Walmart for crying out loud. I know, but it just, I know I'm getting older. And I know the young people are like, oh, he's, he's, oh, he's over the hill now. Because that's just what we do. But what about this thing about being in church? Uh, why do they have to clean up and change the clothes? I want you to imagine for a moment that you got home tomorrow, you get home tomorrow, and you have an official-looking envelope from the federal government. Relax, not the Internal Revenue Service. Okay? But you have an official-looking envelope from uh, the federal government. It turns out it's from the White House. You open it up, and you have been invited to a concert at the White House. You've been invited to a concert at the White House. Throw the politics away. Forget that, all right? You've just been invited to a concert at the White House. Would you wear your flip-flops and your shorts? If you did, you would do so because you were making a statement. Wouldn't you? 
You would do so because you were making statements. You would do so because you were making a statement about somebody who was there. The way you dress to go to that event will probably either demonstrate that you have a problem with somebody who's there in that place or that you respect somebody who's there in that place. Now, if we give thought to the way we dress when we go to the White House, shouldn't we think about how we dress when we show up to meet the maker of heaven and earth? God the Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now listen very carefully. Don't miss what I'm saying. If all you've got is tennis shoes, then you wear them. But brush them off. Okay? If all you've got is shorts, then you come to church. But wash them. If all you've got is a t-shirt, I would rather you be here than stay home and think you can't come with a t-shirt. But can't you take a bath before you come? It's not about making ourselves worthy of meeting God. Because let's face it, nothing can make us worthy. My tie and my suit does not make me worthy to meet God. I know that. I know that. It's not about me making myself worthy to meet God. It's about preparing my heart to meet God. You see, what the way we appear on the outside says something about how we're feeling and thinking on the inside. When you went to the White House, whether you wore shorts because you're mad at the person in the White House or you wore a suit because you respect the person in the White House, it is reflecting something that's in your heart and your mind. It's more about what you're thinking than what you're actually doing on the outside. And Jacob intuitively knows that he's going to meet with God. Did you expect to meet with God when you came into this room today? Did you expect to meet with God? when you came to this room. Jacob is going to Bethel with the absolute expectation that he will meet with God. He's met with him before in this place and he expects to meet with him again. Here, here's what I'd like you to write down on, on the next thing. Why did Jacob get rid of the idols? Very simple. Jacob expected to meet with God so he prepared to meet with God. Very simple. He expected to meet with God and so he prepared to meet with God. I hope, church, that all of us, when we gather together here, and it's not because of the place, it's because of why we're here. When we gather here on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, or whatever time we come together, or when we gather together in someone's home in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, wherever it might be, I hope that we have an expectation in our hearts that is reflected, not just in our clothes, but in our demeanor, in our face, in the way that we act. I expect to meet God in this place. Because we're coming together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 5. Then they set out, and the terror of God fell upon the towns all around them so that no one that pursued them. What's this all about? Well, once again, in context, what just happened in chapter 34? We looked at it last week, and if you didn't hear that, I urge you to get the DVD or go on the website and look at that message so that you understand where Jacob is coming from here. It was a horrible, horrible event. First of all, Jacob's daughter is raped, and then his sons massacre a town and plunder it. And Jacob, at the end of that story, calls his sons in and he says, What have you done? You have made me a stench to all the surrounding peoples, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and they will, they're going to come against me and destroy me. So he is afraid at this point, because of what his sons have done, that he and his household will be destroyed. And so what God does here in verse 5, as he sets out to travel to Bethel, God knows that he needs protection. He knows that the peoples around them are angry at them for the injustice, of the unjust thing that they've done to Shechem. And so God puts terror on the peoples around them, and he protects Jacob and his family. Now, if you stop and think that, it doesn't take you very long to ask this question. What in the world is God doing protecting a bunch of murderers? Where's the justice of God in that? Jacob and his sons obliterated a town. They murdered all the males. Maybe, maybe Shechem should have been put to death for raping Dinah. Maybe if we stretch it, Hamor was guilty because that was his son and he did nothing about it. But does that really justify coming in and destroying every male in the town of Shechem, Shechem, taking their women and their children and taking all of their goods? No way in the world. No way in the world.
This is an unadulterated example of something that we sing about that we may not have completely thought through. We call it the amazing grace of God. There's nothing else happening here but God demonstrating His grace on Jacob and his sons. Now grace is undeserved favor, unmerited favor. Secretly in our hearts, I'm afraid that all of us have failed to admit to ourselves that we somehow think that we deserve God's grace. That we're better than the other, the people who aren't getting God's grace aren't getting it because they don't really deserve it and God's showing us His grace because somehow or another we deserve it. But the thing about God's grace that makes it amazing is that it is not deserved. And when you see a stark example of it, it's really, it's really something that causes you, it can take your breath away. Wait a minute. God is going to protect these men who have massacred a town and taken the women and children and plundered it? Is that what God's grace is? Where is His justice? Isn't God also a just and righteous and holy God? When Moses met with God in Exodus 33, he sped up with the people, he said, look, just show me your glory. And God said, you, you can't see my face, but I'll show you my glory. I'll, I'll hide you in the cliff of the rock and, and, and cover you with my hand. And after I pass by, I'll, I'll remove my hand and you'll see my back. And a tremendous passage of Scripture. Uh, and as God came by, He declared His name to Moses, it says, uh, Yahweh. And here's what He said, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Very troubling. Is God unfair? Where is God's justice? There's a little hint in here that helps us with this. J Jacob never said that when he came back that he would build an altar. That wasn't part of the vow. He would come back, that that, house, that would be the house of God, and that he would give an, uh, a tithe to the Lord. But when the Lord tells him to go back to uh, Bethel, he adds this on. He says, I want you to go back to Bethel, and I want you to build an altar there, which is a, just a little hint that maybe there was some offering that needed to be offered, a sin offering. Maybe there was some redemption that was going to take place there. How many of you have noticed this? This uh, Muslim blogger that was arrested in Saudi Arabia, his name's uh, Raif Badawi. Raif Badawi runs a website where he encourages people to speak openly about political and religious issues. Well, uh, if you haven't been keeping up with the world, they don't do that in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and in fact, to do so is very dangerous. Uh, and Raif Badawi has been arrested. He's 31 years old, and he has been sentenced to 10 years in prison and a thousand lashes. A thousand lashes. The thousand lashes is so intense that they, they're not even going to give them all to him at one time because he probably would die. And so they're giving this Rav Badawi a thousand lashes, and the, there are seven of the nine members of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom have sent a letter to the, um, to the government in Saudi Arabia and said, we want to take the thousand lashes for Rayef Badawi. Each of the seven have said, each of them have said, I want you to give me a hundred of the lashes that Rayef Badawi should get. And, and the other one, same thing. So they've, they've got 700 of his lashes covered if the government were to agree with that. Now, any preacher of Christianity, unless he's absolutely asleep, flunked uh, seminary, or doesn't have a clue what's going on, is not going to miss the wonderful illustration there of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. Remember what the Bible says? By His stripes we are healed. He took the stripes upon Him that we deserve so that we could be set free. And so it's clearly, there's a picture of Jesus in here of these seven men saying, give me Rehoboth Badawi's stripes. But there's a problem. There's a problem with the comparison. And we, we need to make sure that we catch the error in this comparison. I wonder if anybody in here gets it. If this was Sunday night, we'd stop and discuss it. But we don't do that on Sunday morning, so... I'll just hope that you're doing that in your own brain. 
What is the problem? What is the problem with that comparison? The problem is this. None of us think that Rev Medawi deserves those thousand lashes. We just don't. It's unfair. In fact, if those commissioners thought Raf Badawi deserved those thousand lashes, they would not have been sending a letter to the Saudi Arabian government and offering to take the lashes in his stead. The reason that they're taking those lashes is not because they love Raf Badawi, they've never met him. The reason that they're willing to take those lashes is because they're making a political statement that's meant to embarrass the Saudis and say that what you're doing is unfair. And in that respect, it is not a comparison with what's happening with God's grace. Because before we can understand God's grace, we must understand this, church, and let me tell you, the Western world has a hard time with this. Every single one of us deserves, deserves, has earned, by our disobedience, eternity in hell. And until we understand that, we cannot understand the grace of God. Can't do it. As long as we think that God is unfair for sending people to hell, then the cross is meaningless to us. We run into a Jacob, and we say, well, Jacob, Jacob and his bunch, man, they deserve to be they deserve to be punished. And God says that's exactly right. They did. What they did was horrible. And I'm going to protect them anyway. That is the grace of God. That's the real grace of God. Now, if you're still wondering, but what about justice? Well, justice is there. The New Testament tells us that all of these sins in the Old Testament that were committed were put on a spiritual credit card. And that credit card got a pretty high balance on it. And when Jesus died on the cross, he paid off that, that debt. And he put so much aside, so much righteousness aside through the cross that it's still paying off our debt to this very day. And if a thousand more generations live and die on planet Earth and continue to sin, all of their debt could be paid by his cross as well. To understand the grace of God, we have to understand the righteousness of God. And we have to understand how horrible the things that we do really are. And Jacob's, what Jacob does here really shows it. Okay, let's write something down. Why did God protect murderers? Why did God protect murderers? Good question. Jacob and his family enjoyed God's undeserved favor, his unmerited favor, his grace. And that's not a flippant statement. When we start to dig into it as we were just doing, we realize how intense that really is. By the way, God didn't tell Jacob that he was going to protect him. He just did. Jacob had to move by faith. He had to move knowing that his family was endangered by these people around him who were angry. He did it anyway. We too have to grab God's grace by faith. Verse 6, Jacob and all the people with him came to Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan. Now the land of Canaan is important because that's the promised land. That's the land promised to Abraham, his grandfather, Isaac, his father, and Jacob, and his sons, and the Israelites. Verse 7, there he built an altar and he called the place El Bethel. 20 years before, 20 plus years before, he called it Bethel. Now he renames it again, but instead of just calling it Bethel, he calls it El Bethel. Look at the verse again. Because it was there that God revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother some 20 some odd years before. So he's fulfilling his promise. That the, the implication is that he gives the tithe and does all the things that he promised to do. But what catches the eye here is that he called it El Bethel instead of Bethel. Bethel is Beth, house, El, God. El is the generic term for God in the Old Testament. Elohim, the plural version of it. So Beth, El is house of God. Now he's calling it El, Beth, El. God, house of God. God's getting bigger in all of this not just the house of God, it's the God of the house of God. As Jacob grows and uh, spiritually he sees that God is bigger and bigger and bigger uh, and his ideas of God get bigger and bigger. And 20 years ago when he saw God in this place he said, how awesome is this place? Now he's saying, how awesome is the God of this place? 
Because I realized that the, the God of this place isn't just stuck in this place. He's gone with me. He went with me to Pagan Abram. He was with me in Shechem. He was with me on the journey uh, from Shechem to here. And I believe he's going to be with me wherever I go. Wherever I go. Andy and I went Friday night to see the sniper movie. We were disappointed. Not in the movie because we didn't get to see it. We were disappointed because it was sold out. Uh, we had to pick another movie to watch. So all I know of the movie so far is what I've read about the movie. And my goodness, it has stirred up some controversy. It has stirred up some, and uh, of course I love a good controversy, so, so that gets me to read. But as I read, I learned something that's uh, a different kind of controversy. You know, the controversy that's in the news is about, uh, uh, about glorifying war and all those kinds of things. And, and that's a good debate to have that, but there's another thing going over here that, that's also important. Chris Kyle, this U.S. Navy uh, SEAL sniper who was called the legend because he uh, had 160 kills through four tours to uh, missions to Iraq, uh, and obviously saved a lot of lives. And when he came back, he had a hard time getting back into life here, as many soldiers do. And one of the things that he found that gave his life meaning and purpose was helping other veterans who were struggling to get their lives back together after having been in the horrors of war. And unfortunately, one of those soldiers took his life away from him. And so his story is compelling. It's fascinating. And it's worthy of the book that he wrote about it and worthy of the movie that's been made out of it. It's worthy of talking about and thinking about. But there's something in the movie, apparently, that's missing from his story. Something that was very important to him when he wrote the book. And the something was the fact that in his life, God was number one. He said it was God, country, and family, but as he grew, he began to wonder if maybe family shouldn't come before country sometime. But the point is that God was number one. And for some reason, I think we probably all already know why, that was left out of the movie. Do you think that's an important part of Kyle's story? And then somebody was saying, well, that's interesting because there's been another movie made recently, too, from a book, Unbroken. Some of you may have read that book or seen that movie uh, about a gentleman named uh, Louis Zamperini, who was a POW in World War II, and has a, another compelling story of a soldier that in many ways was like Chris Kyle's. And he, too, found victory in all the things that he was struggling with, his days of distress, through his faith in God, through Jesus Christ. Prominent in the book, but in the movie, guess what? Missing. Why? Why? Apparently, there are some people who think that God has no jurisdiction in movies or Hollywood or entertainment. Right? They're going to be surprised someday to find out that God's jurisdiction has no boundaries at all. God goes everywhere. He is everywhere. Here's the last thing I'd like to write down today. Why did Jacob rename Luz again? He had already named it to, Beth to Bethel. Now he named it to El Bethel. Jacob was learning that God's jurisdiction is unlimited. His jurisdiction is unlimited. The president gave his seventh State of the Union address this week, ten, and shortly after that, had a meeting, a 10-minute meeting that was set up between him and a family, a, a wife, mother, and her two children, son and daughter. They are the wife and the children of Sayed Abedini. Sayed Abedini is a citizen of the United States of America. He was originally an Iranian, originally Islamic. He converted to Christianity. And he continued to travel back from his now home country, the United States of America, back to Iran to build a government-approved orphanage. But he was well known as someone who was a Christian, who was in charge with, who was in contact with um, house churches in Iran. And uh, one of the worst things that you can be in the Islamic world is someone who has converted from Islam to Christianity. And so on one of his trips back, about two and a half years ago, he was nabbed off of a bus. He was thrown in prison, uh, supposed to stay there for eight years. He's been beaten. He's been tortured. He's been uh, told that he needs to recant his Christian faith, and he refuses to do so. And this morning, as far as we know, he's still in the midst of a day of distress. And 
And his wife and his son and daughter, two little children, met for 10 minutes with uh, President Barack Obama after his speech for 10 minutes. They got an opportunity to plead with him and say, please, can't you help us bring our father, my husband home? Jacob, the little boy, had the opportunity to speak to the president. He said, Mr. President, would you bring my daddy home before my birthday? And the president said, well, son, when is your birthday? He said, it's March 17th. I'll be seven years old. And the president said, I will do the best that I can to bring your daddy home. But we wonder, don't we? He is the most powerful man in the free world, but does his jurisdiction really extend? into a prison in Iran? I don't know. But I know somebody who, who does. Right now, this morning, if Sayed Abedini could somehow or another be standing right here in front of us, he would tell us, I have no doubt in my mind, that God's jurisdiction extends even to that prison where he is right now. If God's jurisdiction has no limits in your life or in mine. The only ones that that we think are there are the ones that we've set up in their foolishness. This means two things, church. First of all, it means that no matter how much distress you may be in this morning, how much you're struggling, God can get to you. The strong arm of the Lord can reach you no matter how bad or dark it looks. That's the good news. For some of us, the bad news is that in the areas of our life that we're trying to keep God out, guess what? He has jurisdiction there too. Jacob tried to keep God out for a while. He was hiding in Shechem, not going back to Bethel. And he realized, I need to go back to Bethel. I need to fulfill my vows to God. How about you this morning? Have you made a promise to God that you haven't fulfilled? You've, you've kept God out of that part of your life. You've pretended that he doesn't have jurisdiction there. He does. And for those of us who asked Jesus Christ to be Lord, Lord and Savior, part of our promise to God was, church, we said... Years ago, when we bowed the knee and asked Christ into our life, we said, I am yours. You're Lord of my life, all of my life, everything, always. He has jurisdiction. Would you bow your heads with me for just a moment?